Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us for this, this uh, month's germination webinar. Our topic today is agricultural biologicals and natural products, and I think we have a really, really interesting webinar for you today. My name is Patty Townsend. I'm going to be your chair and host and general question answer per provider person. And uh, we've got two very, very interesting speakers. So without further ado, let's move on. First of all, I'd like to thank the sponsors. If we didn't have these sponsors, we wouldn't be able to provide or offer you these, these very informative webinars. So thank you very much to Bayer, Syngenta, CCAN, FP Genetics, and 2020 Seed Labs. Our program for today is on the slide now. We're going to do some introductions and the process for the webinar. Uh, we'll have a presentation from Adrian at Bayer to talking about biopesticides and natural products. We'll have a short question period, a presentation on, uh, from John Trelore at Monsanto, BioAg from, on microbi microbials and biofertility pro products, then questions again, and then some conclusions. Uh, getting into the process, if you have questions at any time, you'll see a chat box on the left-hand side of your screen, and you can pose your questions there. We'll group them together, and we will present them to our speakers during our question periods. And my mouse isn't working. So now I'm going to introduce to you Adrian, and I'm not saying your last name, Adrian, because I'm not really sure how to, pre to uh, pronounce it, so we'll let you do that. Adrian is a product development manager with Bayer. His responsibilities include soil applied biologics and insecticides and digital farming development. Adrian's worked with Bayer for four years, spending the first three with the biologics group in West Sacramento, California, leading the foliar entomology team and an insecticide discovery project team. Adrian's current role is to assess the potential of his products in the field through trials across the country. He's passionate about agriculture and the potential of biologics to bring greater sustainability. Adrian balances his love of research with spending time with his wife and his three young children. So with no further ado, Adrian, you're on. Hi, Patty. Thanks for the introduction. As you said, my name is Adrian Duell, and I work for Bayer Crop Science. And I'm going to talk about what I know about biologicals and trying to just describe them to you and help you understand how you can use them in your crops. So I'm going to start off just talking about what they are, how they're discovered. I'm going to talk about why they're interesting and hot right now, guide you through the discovery and development process, and then really focus on one of our products that's Serenade. And so first I'll start with just some de definitions so you can understand exactly what I mean. So in general, Bayer turns to work with microbials. So these are products derived from bacteria fungi, or viruses, and this can either be the organism itself or the chemistry produced during fermentation. And I'm just going to give you a few examples of those. And so natural products are actually the chemistry produced by the organism. And generally, these are things that are produced for defense. And so um, many of these are already things that you probably know and use. Some of these might be things that you've read about and have decided not to use. Um, so one is, one is neem oil, and this has azadractin in it, and that's that very complicated molecule that's drawn on your right. And the reason that I highlight that is some of these natural products are very complicated. And so these aren't things that can be produced synthetically in the laboratory and delivered as synthetic chemicals. They really have to be purified from those natural products. Others, like pyrethrum, is originally from chrysanthemums, and from that, the active elements of that came pyrethroids, which are, of course, synthetic, commonly used pesticides. There are also some that are microbially based, such as spinosad, strobal urine as a fungicide, and the whole class of strobal urines, all the different synthetic versions, and then also abamectin as a miticide. And so these are specific chemicals that, that were made by these organisms and that have either been used by themselves or used as synthetic compounds. So one of the things that's really interesting about these natural products, and this is both for kind of these very specific ones as well as whole groups of chemistry produced by organisms, is they're produced through natural pathways. So as the microbes are growing, they're producing these chemicals. And because it's produced through this natural pathway, generally there are also pathways to break it down. So here I've just put on the right an example of um, 
a permethrin, which is a pyrethroid, and you can see here that there are certain places in the molecule that it breaks down in the environment. And synthetic versions of pyrethroids tend not to have these specific bonds that are easily broken. They're substituted with other chemicals. But these bonds let these be broken down into non-toxic versions. And the reason that that's important is that then there are fewer issues with residues in the field or in the food because of this envi either environmental breakdown or breakdown after an animal has consumed them. Now, the challenge here is then these might have limited shelf life or a shorter period of efficacy in the field. And so th those are some of the challenges that we wrestle with in development and discovery of these sorts of products. And so since I'm talking to Canadians, I generally work in the U.S., but I asked one of my regulatory colleagues about the process in Canada around these natural products and biologicals. And the things that they outlined as some of the important differences are the way that they're regulated. So, for example, it's much cheaper to submit a biological in Canada. You can see there it's only about $7,000 as opposed to $300,000 for a small molecule. The agency will review them faster, either for a new AI or just a use expansion. And then also there are fewer studies that are required, and this comes back to the way that they may break down in the environment. And so if there are no, um, if there aren't any issues that are discovered in the preliminary tests that are required, there are then, um, you don't have to do further tier studies. So for example, if, if there isn't any indication of initial toxicity, you probably don't have to do long-term chronic exposure studies because these compounds will be broken down in the organism and won't be there for long periods of time. And therefore, it's both cheaper and faster to go through that testing process for safety. And now, on the other hand, for these microbials, since we're putting living organisms out to the environment, there are additional permitting requirements to allow them to be placed into the environment. That's because, theoretically at least, these could grow and spread more like an invasive species in the environment, and so we, kind of, we have to then show in advance that these are not going to spread and evaluate that initially. So this is a Bayer-focused slide for the biological group that talks about what's going on with Bayer and Bayer's interests. And so here are some of the reasons that Bayer is really highlighting the importance of biologicals. So for one, they support sustainable agriculture with an excellent pest management and integrated pest management set. And so they are act more active on targets, and the ones that are selected for development are also more specific. Um, and so they're safer on the non-target organisms. They're very convenient to use and flexible for reentry. And so this means that after you apply them, you can go back in the field sooner and harvest more rapidly. And that's due to the safety features. Um, they'll also provide new modes of action generally and also kind of already be stacked. So there will be multiple elements within a microbial product which have different types of modes of action. And so it's difficult to develop resistance. And then right now Bayer is heavily involved in trying to develop programs where you can use the biological along with small molecule chemistry to get to develop a program that will enable less small molecule use and put biologicals in at appropriate times to get the most activity. And so um, why exactly is it a time when we should be excited about these? Microbials have been worked on for a long time. Some of the ones that I talked about earlier, um, certainly BTs have been around and known for many years. But there are some things going on with discovery right now which makes it really interesting. So it might be when you think about global diversity, you think about the large animals and plants you might see walking across the landscape. But there's also a lot of diversity of microbes on that landscape. And so this is a chart that I pulled from a recent paper in Science. And it, each one of the little red dots represents new species or new families of microbes which have not been previously known. And so you can see in the red circle that I have up on the screen there, um, this is a whole group of new species that hadn't been previously discovered. And this is because of some of the new techniques being used around sequencing. And so you can sequence the soil sample and get a feel for what sorts of organisms are there. And even if you hadn't been able to previously grow them, you know that you're there, they're there, and then you can start working on how to grow them. And so this just 
all of this new diversity gives us the potential to discover new chemistry, new interactions, and then really perhaps have a better fit with the system that we're trying to control the organism in. Um, going a little further into some of the definitions, bacteria are single cell organisms, and they're both abundant and diverse. And I was trying to figure out a way to describe the, the number of bacteria, and so I pulled a few numbers um, that might help you at least understand how hard it is to imagine that just the sheer number. So first of all, there are more bacteria on Earth than there are stars in the universe. And at 10 to the 30, um, if they were pennies, the stack would reach a trillion light years. And just to put a little context there, um, for a human in your lifetime, you'll probably have about 2.5 billion heartbeats, which would just be a tiny, tiny fraction of this. And these can yield chemistry, biologics, or protein. And so depending what sort of product we're trying to develop, we may be able to discover it by looking into bacteria. You can discover a chemical that might be able to be developed into a small molecule. You can develop it as a biological, where you're working with the whole organism. Or you can take a protein, develop it either as a biological by itself, or put it into a plant and have a transgenic plant. And so the process here on the right that I'm showing is generally how most of the microbes that are developed are discovered, and so they're first isolated from most from the environment, many times from soil. They're then plated and grown, and I'll show that a little bit more in a moment. Once they're isolated in this way, they're then fermented at a small scale. They are um, tested and screened, scaled up, and then fully scaled up and developed into final end use products. And the way this looks is as it grows in a liquid culture, you have a whole broth, and that's there at the top. And I have some different colors there, um, and that's just kind of thinking about the diversity. They, they even look very different when they're grown in a liquid in terms of what sorts of compounds that are produced, and some of these are colored compounds. And so then we can discover them either by exposing them to organisms of interest. And so here's a bioassay on the left-hand side on insects. So you put insects in a well, the diet is coated with a whole broth, and we see if that has any effect. You can look at the chemistry to see if there's any novel chemistry in that broth, or you can sequence the bacteria and then ask questions about what sorts of genes does it have. And one of the reasons sequencing is an important tool and becoming a more common tool is it's just getting cheaper and cheaper. And so this is showing the cost of sequencing, and so if you look back in 2001, it was almost $10,000 to sequence 1,000 base pairs. So just a very small piece of DNA cost about $10,000, and at the present, that, that costs about a penny. And so we can now sequence the entire bacterial organism and look into their DNA to see what chemicals they have the potential of producing, and also identify bacteria that are significantly different from each other in order to evaluate them to see if they might be active. And what exactly is a bacteria? So if you look on a, jar, on a container of a biological, generally the activity is captured by the number of CFUs, or colony-forming units. And so that would be the number of single bacterial cells that are capable of growing and producing a colony. And the way that the CFUs are determined are First, the bacteria is formulated, is fermented, and then a small subsample of that is diluted, and you go through a serial dilution process and plate out, so this is plating out at the bottom, each one of these solutions, a certain amount, and then at the point when you can count the number of cells, the number of individual colonies that are formed on that plate, you can then back calculate and figure out how many CFUs or colony forming units you had initially. And so generally, these are then regulated by the number of these colony-forming units that are in the jug as opposed to the chemistry. And I'll talk about why that's important a little bit later. And so here's a picture of just bacterial diversity. Here's what it looks like when you just played out a soil sample on some different media. You can see the number of different bacteria that are on there. And then we can also look at individual bacterial colonies. And as they grow, they have different morphology or they look different as they're growing. So here's one that initially grows white, 
and then at high density it produces another chemical which is orange. Here's, here's another that produces different morphologies as it grows. You can see this is the same bacteria and sometimes it's growing as white and sometimes it's growing as yellow. Here's another. This is a bacillus. Um, this actually is the bacillus that's in our Serenade product. And here's another bacillus that grows with a different kind of wrinkled surface morphology. And so as they want to, as in order to purify these, you'll take one colony from a fairly complex site, you'll streak it onto another plate in one direction, streak it in a second direction, and a third direction, and then you let it grow for a few weeks or a few days, depending on the bacteria. And then you can see, you can, you've separated out, and you can at that point take pure individual colonies that grew from a single bacterial cell. I'm now going to talk a little bit about the Bayer portfolio and the type of activity that we have. And so here we're looking, there's a spectrum of types of activity. So you can either have things that are active only as the actual organism or things where the chemistry is really important for the activity. And so bioact is an entomopathogenic, is actually a nematode um, killing fungus. And so it doesn't really have to produce any chemistry to be active. It's actually that the organism itself grows and kills the nematodes. We then have other products like Motivo and Serenade in the soil, which have both natural products they produce, so chemistry that's produced, and then there's also an effect of the organism. And then we have other products that are more chemistry focused, and this is actually one that we discontinued because there were some toxic elements of that um, particular molecule and biological that were not uh, something things that Bayer wanted to work with. And so if we contrast what you have in the jug for a small molecule, so here's Serenade. Uh, here's Serenade on this side. And as you can see in that jug, we have the microbe itself. So here's the bacteria. We have a number of different lipopeptides, and they have this shape. We have some other um, chemistry that will control the plant diseases, and we have some chemistry that interacts with the plant and increases plant growth. Whereas on the other hand, our Devonto product is made up of a single molecule. And so in that jug, you'll have a single molecule and things used to formulate it and keep it in solution. And so as we think about these different types of products, it's very different in terms of what you actually have. Thinking about the activity of those different elements, so here's the activity of the lipopeptides in Serenade. At the top, you can see the lipopeptides are able to insert themselves into the cell membranes of a fungus, a plant pathogen, and kill the plant pathogen. So here's what it looks like on a molecular level, and here's what it looks like if you look at the plant pathogen. So here's one growing normally, and here's what happens with the application of Serenade, where those cell walls are lice and the fungus is unable to grow. Serenade also grows with the roots of a plant. And so here you can see a control root as we zoom in. So here's a light microscope, fluorescence micro microscopy, and a scanning electron microscopy, a clean plant root. And then here it is with the serenade biofilm. And so you have serenade growing around the plant. And this does a number of different things. So as it grows around the plant and on the root exudates, it colonizes the root. It produces a biofilm. That biofilm signals to the other microbes in the soil. It also signals to the plant. And this can help the plant grow faster. It can control diseases in the soil. And it can also do things like increase the nutrient availability by solubilizing some of the different nutrients that are in the soil. We also have another product, product Motivo, which has nematicidal properties. And so here's a petri dish based assay that shows when you have Votivo growing on your corn root. There's a zone around the root where Votivo is growing, and in this case the nematodes are repelled by the Votivo organism growing there. In addition, there's some volatile cues that these organisms can give off. And so in this example, we have the serenade growing on one side of the plate. There's a wall of plastic in the middle, and then we have Arabidopsis plants growing on the other side. And you can see where there's just water, the Arabidopsis plants are growing slightly slowly, and in the presence of serenade, the Arabidopsis plants both grow larger visually, and if we then dry them and weigh them, you can see that they are also heavier at that point. 
And so Serenade, very complex product, a lot of different things going on. In many ways, it can positively interact with the plant. And then I just have one last set of examples here. So right now, I'm working on developing Serenade in corn for, as an infero treatment. Someone else also worked on this, and so we have three years of field data at the moment looking at the corn response, and this is in the Midwest of the U.S. And so you can see here that there's a, variation, there's a fair bit of variation in the response. So sometimes we see a positive response over uh, far to your right. We might occasionally see a, less, a negative response to the left, and then, ingest, then there's places in the middle where we don't really see a significant response. On average, we, we do have a positive effect in corn. And I'm trying to do research right now to really determine what are the optimal types to apply serenade to make sure that we have the best interaction with the plant and the environment to incre maximally increase the yield. And this is based on another set of research. These are some larger plot demo trials that we put out. Um, you can see here there's a greater percent positive, a larger increase. And then if we subset this data, so we look just at the irrigated plot, you can see that in the cases where the corn is irrigated, serenade is put in the furrow, at all the tested doses, we have a positive response. And so we're working on further narrowing down how exactly serenade should be used in the field to optimize and increase the performance. And so just a quick summary here. In the history of microbial, generally, active strains were discovered through the bioassay and cell-type organisms. And so this is just microbes directly collected from the field. These strains are sometimes optimized with fermentation and microbiology techniques, and then supported with chemistry and biology assays, and in general have been less active, certainly on a per, per unit basis, than the conventional chemistry. Currently, there are a number of different companies working on some hypothesis-based isolations. So finding microbes where plants are growing really well or where pests are not as much of a problem, identifying them and the diversity through sequencing, and, this, and putting a really high investment of resources into characterization through both bioassays and microbiology. In the future, I would expect to see more biotechnology and using that bacteria as a vehicle for different types of chemistry and, as well as proteins. And this will probably come with more regulations, but also more exciting end-use products. And so some of the benefits that we are already seeing are flexible products, a faster registration product process, less expensive developing uh, development, and then this will lead to better overall integrated best, uh, pest management programs using both chemistry and biological. There is a bit of a challenge that you really need to think about applying these and where they're the best fit, and also where you're going to get the best stability and residual and what you need from stability and residual for your application. And for our product, I hope you can enjoy Serenade and Votivo. You've probably seen them. Um, and if not, please look into them. They're an interesting product. Thanks for your attention. And um, ah, one last thing, uh, my disclaimer statement, I do not know the future. I don't know how biologicals are going to work. Um, but these are just my opinions. Thank you very much, and I'll take any questions. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Adrian. We do have, uh, again, if you want to ask questions, there is a chat box on the left. Type your question in. If you get too late for this question session, we'll carry them over for the next one. Um, we do have two questions. One of them is, with Serenade, for example, does the biological thrive in the same culture as the sclerotinia itself? For example, cool, high hum humidity, et cetera. Um, so for the example I gave with Serenade, it's actually the chemistry, the lipopeptide chemistry that's in the product that you're applying that has the control of the, um, of the disease. And therefore, the, the biological doesn't need to be growing on the leaves in order to have that activity. Um, in the soil, as applied, generally, at temperatures where the plant can grow, the biological then also does fairly well. Um, for example, that you said kind of cool, high humidity, we're not going to have the fastest growth at that 
in cooler temperatures, but it tends to, to grow in the same sorts of conditions that plants grow well. Okay, I hope that answered your question. If you have any other questions, just type them back into the box. We have one more question I'm not sure as a researcher you're going to be able to answer, but I'll ask it anyway. And it is an intellectual property protection uh, question. Is it possible for you to comment on the intellectual property angle for these products? Do you use utility patents? Do you sequence the whole organism and patent it? Or do you, uh, how do you protect the intellectual property, or do you? Okay, I can answer some of that. Um, I'm not exactly sure what a utility patent is. Um, I'm, that may be more of a Canadian than a U.S. term. Um, no, it's actually really, a U.S. Not, term. <laughs> oh, that is U.S. Okay, no, I don't know about the utility side, but I can comment on kind of patent um, strategy at least a little bit. Um, so in the case of Serenade, the patent around Serenade revolves pretty heavily around a specific element of the chemistry. So it produces a class of chemistry, I believe it's called agrostatin. It's a kind of lipopeptide. And that was discovered in Serenade, and so we were able to patent that chemistry. And I, th I believe that's our strongest intellectual property protection around Serenade. Um, you can sequence and patent a whole organism, but generally bacteria are very diverse, even in quite similarly related organisms. And so that wouldn't actually be the strongest patent because you could then, someone else could, could isolate a very similar bacillus and still build that as a product. So generally there's much stronger protection if you find something truly unique about a strain and you would then patent that unique element as opposed to the strain as a whole. Great. Thank you very much, Adrian. So again, if you have questions throughout the rest of the presentations, just type them into the chat box and we'll make sure that they get asked. So our next speaker is John Trelore. John is a technical agronomist and currently member of Monsanto's technical development team where he leads field testing efforts, field scale and small plot for bioag technologies in Canada. John has a bachelor's in agroecology from the University of British Columbia and a master's, an interdisciplinary master's from the University of Saskatchewan. John joined Novozymes three years ago and moved over to Monsanto on the creation of the BioAg Alliance. He has an extensive background in technical training and educational outreach. And I like this statement, having a fond affinity for cold and a fear of the mountains, John and his family live in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. So John, with no further ado, it's yours. Great. Thanks, Patty. Exciting to be here today to talk about uh, something I'm quite passionate about, and that's biologicals. Uh, being within the BioAg Alliance for the last three years has really been uh, showing some giant leaps forward in our understanding and our approach with uh, biological seed treatments. So today I want to talk a little bit about uh, some of the background of biologicals, just briefly touch upon that, and then really kind of drill down into our field first approach that we take within BioAg and uh, the testing program that we run, I want to look at some of the technologies that we employ within our products and then as a producer, as a retailer, kind of how and where, when to use the products and what they look like and how, how you can get biologicals into the production system in your, in your geographies. And it really is, I think, an exciting time to be involved with biologicals. We really have just, I think, are at the tip of the iceberg for our understanding. We know that uh, microbes play a key role within the ecosystem, that there's an absolute plethora of diversity out there. Uh, I, you know, I look back in, in 100 years and, and say, wow, those guys really didn't know too much about it, and I think the, the learning curve is, is pretty steep that we're on right now. Uh, Adrian was talking a lot about biocontrol aspects, where I'm going to probably talk a little bit more about uh, bio yield in terms of uh, biofertility products. Most of what we have in the BioAg Alliance within Monsanto has centered around fertility opposed to control of, of fungus and insects and things like that. But uh, either way, whether you're dealing with biocontrol, whether you're dealing with biofertility, I think they, they offer some fantastic solutions. And as the cities and as, as people are, are concerned about their food supply, I think this technology 
offers a, a very sustainable approach to production and meeting the, the needs of the future. So, you know, stay tuned to this. I'm, I'm glad that we have so many participants in the webinar, but I think, uh, you know, it, where we're going with this is, is really exciting and to see the Bayer Crop Sciences, the Monsantos, the Novozymes, to see the big ag companies investing so heavily into this powerful technology is an indicator of what's to come down the road. And I think it's, it's really going to help us uh, get to the, the yields that we need in order to uh, feed the planet. So I mentioned a little bit of history. Um, within the BioAg Alliance, we, we have a direct connection to some of the first inoculants in the marketplace. And that goes back you know, through the Novozymes network, through Phil and Bios, and into the nitrogen company before that. But it, it really this game got started in the late 1800s. And I mean, it's only been 130 years or so that we've been using inoculants. So that's kind of when the, the patent started for uh, the, the, the leguminous crops, right? The, the, uh, the rhizobia patents basically is what started it out. They, they knew they had something, but they didn't necessarily know what they had. Uh, you know, it, interestingly enough, inoculants are the first man-made crop inputs. I mean, this was before chemical fertilizers came along. So, you know, we've, we've gained a pretty wide acceptance of rhizobia technology, but uh, it's evolving. You'll see some of our new technologies as well further on in the presentation. But it's, uh, you know, we, we do have that direct link back to the nitrogen company and, uh, you know, into EMD coming out of the States, and then, like I mentioned, Phil and Bios and Novozymes, and here we are today in the BioAg Alliance. And for those of you in tune with the ag media, there's further evolutions happening right now, and I'm not sure if it was just serendipity that uh, Patty put the two of us together, but, you know, I think uh, stay tuned because the story continues to evolve. Just want to mention here briefly the BioAg Alliance that, that I'm involved in today is a strategic alliance between Monsanto and Novozymes. This happened roughly three years ago and really draws on the strength of both organizations. Novozymes is one of the world's leaders in microbial fermentation and production. And you combine that with the seed footprint of currently the biggest seed company in the world. The research and, and development capability of Monsanto is just, you know, orders of magnitude higher than what we could have accomplished back with Novozymes. So you're really bringing together two powerful players in this biological realm. You've got production, which is hugely important for biologicals because it's got nuances of its own being living organisms you're dealing with. And then this, the seed footprint and this testing footprint on the Monsanto side. And really what that does, ultimately that's going to benefit your customer. It's going to benefit the grower. It's going to help make sure you have the right product on time in the right geographies that are going to boost yields. And to get there, it's just a, a huge amount of work. Within the BioAg Alliance, we really pride ourselves on our field-first approach. So we go out into the field and test these microbes in an immense way that's never been seen before. I know from this summer, uh, we had over 2,000 new strains of microbes being tested in the field in over 500,000 locations, 500,000 plots. I mean, this is a number that is, is, as an agronomist, it kind of blows your mind, but this is the type of investment that companies are making in this technology, right? This isn't just, yeah, flash in the pan, maybe biologicals are, are a cool thing this week and we'll move on to something else. No, this is a tremendous amount of work going into it. Um, I know, like I mentioned before, just we back at Novozymes couldn't have done this without the, the testing footprint from Monsanto. So we're, we really want to take this field-first approach and screen the microbes in the field for this consistent crop benefit and understand in what environments they're going to be working in, what, what systems they're going to be working in, figure out which ones are going to give us the most benefit and then kind of take it back to the yield, into the lab and start working with the fermentation process and production. It's, uh, it's a little bit backwards, but we have seen in the past where you go the kind of the other way and you start with the microbes and then kind of messing with them in the lab a little bit more when you translate that into the field. Production or, or the benefits kind of fall off. Field first, that's kind of further, further down the pipeline or up the pipeline but it's further away from what I do. I don't deal with novel microbes. 
it's going to be this handoff. And both teams, both Novozyme and Monsanto have, I like to refer to them as bioprospectors that go out into these unique environments and look for these novel microbes. Once after two or three years in these initial testing stages, then they'd hand off to somebody in tech development like myself, where we further develop that story. But it's, it's exciting. Uh, it's, you know, I think to see what's coming in the pipeline and to see that we will have, you know, brand new microbes to help boost yield and protect plants within, you know, shorter term for, for R&D, you know, in that five to seven year type of time frame. But it's coming for sure. And I know, you know, we had, I was just at a presentation this morning and, and our tech development group overall within Monsanto had about 1.5 million plots in the ground and over 40,000 trials this year. So it's, it's testing, 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 and it, it's local testing to make sure that we have the right products at the right, you know, use correctly, basically. And, you know, for Canada, it is a new marketplace, right? Uh, I know most of the audience is Canadian, but as, as people are probably aware of, in 2013, the Canadian Food Inspection Agency dropped the requirement for products registered under the Fertilizers Act, so like I'm talking about these biofertility products, you no longer have to prove efficacy. And after that happened in 2013, the marketplace started to become flooded with products that are out there. And some of them are backed by sound agronomy and sound data, and some of them are very suspect. Um, I'll just say that. I mean, it's, it really is an environment where it's buyer beware. And as a producer, as a retailer who's selling products, as an agronomist who's making recommendations, you know, I think data is the key to being able to, to build trust in different brands and in, in different products that are out there. I mean, in, I built this, this slide last year, but there was in the uh, first 10 months of 2015, there were 74 new registrations issued. Just to give you a sense of, of what's going on in the marketplace, like I mentioned, you know, you see the big players involved in biologicals, but there's lots of, of small companies coming in. And you know what? They might have fantastic products or they might just be trying to capture this kind of momentum that biologicals have. And I've definitely seen some, some questionable products out there. So it's, it's, it, the competitive landscape is definitely is changing. And like I say, as a producer, as a, a retailer, you have to be able to kind of wade through this, this swamp of new products with new mechanisms of action, with new science behind it, and make a recommendation that sounds. Right? So for us, like I've mentioned, we really hang our hat on data and building, building our research program to where it needs to be. So this is where I get involved. Uh, we have both large-scale and field-scale testing to really understand our products and to build up you know, multiple, multiple years and, and multiple locations. So in our program, we rely heavily on, on third-party cooperators and our Monsanto network. So you know, we do some fantastic work with companies like AgQuest. We've got uh, companies like CNM Seeds out east doing some work with us on wheat. So we build protocols and we test them year after year. And we're, we're building, you know, hundreds and hundreds of data points. This is my research program here for small plot. And then we've got, uh, this is in some of the protocols where relevant would be replicated in the states as well. We use randomized complete block. We use uh, six replicates usually per location. I mean, the point is we're, we're building this data story, and we want to be able to, to really hang our hat on the results that we get from it. And then we've got, you know, a legal team that scrubs our data. We've got a, uh, you know, a team of statisticians that works on our data as well. And so, what, you know, we're not making wild claims around, oh, you're going to get 20% on your soybeans or you're going to see, you know, a 15% increase. You know, our, our yield responses are typically in that 5 to 10% range. And, you know, that's the, the cost of inoculants are, are really quite small, all things being equal, and there's return on investment. But the claims we make are based on typically – hundreds of data points if it's, you know, our main claims and uh, at least dozens and dozens. One thing that we launched in 2015 was our BioAdvances trial program, and this is as a producer and a retail, something that you can get involved in, but this is definitely like a, a leading microbial testing program out there. This is grower-led trials that are field scale that uh, work with our products and put them, you know, up against our competitors 
or puts it up against the untreated acre to really prove our technology and showcase it around the country. So this program started in 2015 as our first year of doing this, and we did this to really uh, kind of combat that buyer beware or to help, help growers and, and retailers build trust in our products that we're not, you know, we're not afraid to, to showcase our technologies and to get them out there and hands the growers and into the geographies where they're going to be used. So we learned a lot in 2015. I'll, I'll show you kind of another slide on that. But, you know, we got better at it. So this year we have roughly about 200 trials went in the ground. Hopefully we'll see 120, 130 results from that because there's always things that go a little bit sideways. But we're very focused, so we're doing a lot of work with quick roots, which I'll talk about in a second. Uh, we're doing a lot of work around, say, soybean rate trials and making, looking at granular recommendations for soybean inoculants. I mean, it's, it's very focused and it's, it's very uh, prescribed to our sales reps who help lead these with, with the growers. And they do allow us to work with uh, products that are close to market. So before a product comes to market, we can actually get it out into the field and we have permits from CFIA for crop destruct waivers and things like that. So it's a really exciting program to be involved in in the sense that we're, we're testing our technologies at that field scale in a very visible program. We're not kind of hiding behind just, you know, oh, it's data, we can't look at that kind of stuff. So for 2015, yeah, we had about, about 100, 102 results come in, but it was spread right across the country with basically all of our technologies. These are typically, you know, taken off with, with way wagons and, and signed off by the grower. So it's something that is, is visible. We published results from this. Last year we had some, some fantastic results with Tag Team LCO Granular. We had uh, about 24 locations and over 80% win rate over one of our competitors. So that was uh, pretty fantastic to be able to have as a selling tool. And just like I said, to build trust in this type of technology. A little bit about uh, field testing and the, the scope in which we do it. Like I mentioned, we've really got you know, when you look at it, there's hundreds of thousands of plots around the world. I'm actually in St. Louis right now with a, a global team of uh, seed applied solutions folks. And it's teams from Europe and South America and Asia all working on seed applied solutions, but bioag stuff. And it, to see this global powerhouse come together and, and look at the, the field testing that we do and the scope of what we do, it's, it's incredible where we're going with bio, with bioag. So I want to look at uh, some of our technologies and look at kind of how they work and, and just kind of give a brief overview of uh, some of the mechanism of action. One of our products, our, our flagship product in the granular world, which is more relevant for Western Canada, but uh, the technologies are found all over, all over the country and into the states as well. But Tag Team LCO Granular for Pea and Lentil is a good example of that because it does contain a number of technologies stacked together. Adrian talked a little bit about stacking some of the biocontrol aspects, but that's really a big, a new concept within uh, bioag is this idea of stacking. And it's not just one microbe doing one thing. It's often, you know, one plus one equals three. And just for a simple term, looking at it is you can actually, these microbes play together nicely to use a simple term, but, and often there's some synergies or some additive effects of having numerous technologies employed on the seed or, or in the furrow. So something like Tag Team LCO Granular is a triple action inoculant. So you've got, first of all, this is used in legumes. So it's got the rhizobia that's present to help nodulate the crop and drive nitrogen in. Those, you know, every company has patented strains that they would use that have been selected for basically increasing yield of the commercial crop, right? They're, so they're, uh, they're selected to be able to made in the manufacturing process to survive, to get to the farm, and to live and thrive in the soil and do their job. They're, they're commercially selected for that. So in some places, there's sure, there's native rhizobia, but they aren't selected to increase yield. They're selected for survivability. And so rhizobia is obviously a key piece and, and easily the, the widely, most widely used inoculant out there. I mean, you don't meet too many pea lentil or soybean growers that don't inoculate their crops in, in Western Canada and, and most of Eastern Canada. So it's got the rhizobia present. That's great. There's products out there which is single strain rhizobia. But then we want to involve, evolve our products a little bit. So we've got products like Tag Team LCO, which also contain the, the phosphate solubilizing molecule of Jumpstart, 
plus the LCO molecule, which is a, a lipokido oligosaccharide. I'm only going to say that once. Lucky I don't have to spell it on the webinar here. But the penicillium bali that's present in this, this is the jumpstart technology. This helps free up soil-bound phosphorus. And often in cold, kind of challenging conditions, which we find in the spring, that's when the phosphorus is most needed by a crop, but it's also when it's the most limited. So having that jumpstart or penicillium bali technology present helps free up that early season phosphorus and drive it into the plant. Now, that's going to help with that early season vigor, but it's also going to increase some of your root mass, right? It's uh, phosphorus response is, is an increased root mass with increased fibrous root hairs. Now, with in a, in a system with rhizobia and a legume, that becomes you know equally or doubly important because now you have more surface area for that nodulation process to take place. The initial nodulation process takes place on those fine root hairs, and now with more of them present through the PB technology present, the penicillin bali, you know you're benefiting that system. Now, somewhat new to Canada would be the LCO molecule. Now, this isn't actually a living organism. Bacteria, like uh, the, the rhizobia would be a bacteria. The, the jump start is a fungus. LCO is a, a signaling molecule. Uh, it acts as a communication piece between the rhizobia that's in the soil and the plant root. So the first thing that happens when a plant senses it needs nitrogen or nutrition, it sends out a flavonoid signal. The rhizobia react to that, or they, they basically take that flavonoid signal in, and they send a signal back to the plant root. That signal that they send back to the plant root is the LCO molecule. So having it present within the legume system and within the nodulation process acts to speed up the nodulation process. This process is also slowed down in some of those cooler challenging conditions that we often see, in, especially in Western Canada, in the spring. So having that LCO molecule mitigates some of those stressful conditions and helps to speed up some of that, uh, the nodulation process. Ultimately, you're going to drive nitrogen into your crop earlier, which is going to help increase yield and make a, a, a stronger, healthier plant. So lots of technology in a simple product that, you know, you open up a bag of granular, it just looks like, well, okay, here's, there's my granular. But ton of technology and a, a ton of uh, effort has gone into making a product like that. And we've seen some fantastic results as well. And I mean, those are widely published. Now, lots of excitement out in the industry right now about our newest microbial technology, which is quick roots. This is a, another, this is a seed treatment or there's a, a dry planter box version available. This has been around in the States for about 10 years now. Uh, this is our first big year with quick roots out in the field for field testing. So I've got it all over my small plot and we've got it in roughly uh, 100 field scale locations as well in corn, soy, and wheat. This is a product that's composed of a bacteria and a fungus which work both independently and in concert with each other. So there's a trichoderma virens and a bacillus amyloliquefaction is present in quick roots. And the trichoderma works to free up some of that soil phosphorus, much like your beloved jumpstart technology. It works a similar mechanism to the jumpstart. Uh, it frees up some of that soil phosphorus and frees up some of the, it, well, it's breaking a bond with calcium in the soil. Now that calcium is used in the second reaction with the bacillus amyloliquefaction that uh, releases a phytase enzyme, a novel phytase enzyme, that helps free up some of the nutrients in the organic matter. So again, a little bit more complex uh, synergistic type of mechanism for the quick roots activity. Quick roots is, is probably one of the most responsive microbes that I've ever tested. Uh, this is just taken from the website. I know the print's pretty small for, to see it on the screen, but I mean, it's, it, this information is out there, and if you're interested in seed treatment, it's definitely one to look at. Uh, it's, you, I've seen an over 80% response rate in some of my small plot wheat trials. This is some American data. I just grabbed this off their website, but uh, we continue to test it and to understand this product. I think it, it's pretty exciting, and there are um, two versions. Like I said, there's the wettable powder, and there is the, the dry planter box. But quick roots is something that has got a lot of attention. I see it all over Twitter, and, and it's crept out in some other crops as well. We, and uh, I, I think this year will be a time to really pay attention to what the results are and if it's going to be a, a 
a reasonable seed treatment for you to sell or for you to use on your on your farm. A couple a couple different technologies that I talked about, and then I just kind of want to end off with choosing the right inoculum package, either as a, a retail or an agronomist, as a uh, as a producer. What are some things that you want to think about? Uh, we we talk about availability, talk about application, and then we talk about compatibility. Again, this is stolen from some of my American colleagues here. They talk about 500 trillion new farm hands ready for work. So. You bought into the technologies you want to employ biologicals within your production system. How do you get them? Really, there's two options. We call it the upstream option and the downstream, if you will. The upstream is in the bag from the seed companies. So for in Canada, that would be your jump start on canola in the bag. All you really have to do is check the box. Uh, when you're ordering your canola seed, we're partnered with all different seed companies. So we're on all the decal varieties. We're on. I think all the Bayer varieties or, or the lion's share of them, the pioneer varieties of, uh, of canola, of canola hybrids, where it's simple, check the box, it comes, all the compatibility work and stuff like that is done. You just have to put it in the ground and, and watch the benefits. Uh, for other products, such as quick roots, that's going to be applied at the retail or on the farm. Right? That's what we consider downstream. That would be products, like I said, like quick roots, some of the other inoculants that are used in soybean production or liquid inoculants on pulses. These go on. And so there's a few little caveats when you're, when you're dealing with inoculants. Upstream, like I said, don't really need to think about too much. It's on there. Just basically put it to work. When you're buying inoculants, now whether it's ours, whether it's a competitor, there's things that you need to think about. One of those is how are you going to apply the product? Uh, so we're seeing a lot of uh, treaters out there. There's USC treaters. There are storm treaters as well. But you need to have uh, the the ability to treat that seed. Now, whether it's a, there's different formulations. The, the easiest, really, is using granular inoculant. That doesn't go on seed. That just goes in furrow, so you have an extra tank on your seeder, and in it goes. But for some of the other treatments out there, you need to be cognizant of how to apply the seed and you're looking at you know the different rates and then there's different application methods so you're looking at things like sequential application or simultaneous so the way you add it with your chemistries um, my next slide is about compatibility but I can talk about that here is often you're putting something you know you're putting a fungicide right next to a fungus and are they going to play together well or not and it's it's you know sometimes they'll work well if you apply them sequentially but if you tank mix it's not going to work out for you so we do a lot of work on the compatibility side, and this is you know just some quick examples, but we're always testing new chemistries. Now, compatibility is back on, in the Novozymes camp, but they do a fantastic job of staying abreast of what new chemistries are out there on which crops, and we need to get our treatments on there. So I know Miriam in the lab is going to be doing a lot of work this fall with some of the new chemistries that are out there to make sure that our bioag products are compatible with, uh, with uh, what, what the industry is using as a seed treatment. And then just looking forward, like I mentioned here at the beginning, it's an exciting time for biologicals. And, you know, it really is a systems approach. It's an integrated approach to increasing yield. It's having the right genetics, it's having the right traits, and it's having the right seed treatment. And finding the... the integrated solution that works in your geographies and on your farms. So that, you know, we're, we're part of this exciting seed applied solutions group that's just forming. And uh, I think it's, again, we're, we're, we're really at the, the tip of the iceberg when it comes to understanding biologicals and where we're going with this. It's, it's not going to be individual solutions that, that help take us to the yields that we need. It's going to be an integrated approach, like I said, between kind of seed traits and seed treatments. And I, and I, you know, I'm I'm excited about where we're going and what the future lot what the future holds for for bioag. All righty, thank you very much, John. Uh, we do have a few questions, and so uh, somebody is going to force me to say a very complicated word, but I'll leave that for a bit. The first question is: Does um, does bioag <laughs> develop soil specific microbes? So for each soil type, a different product or even one product for certain soil and crop varieties and another product for a different soil and crop for, uh, circumstance? 
at the moment, short answer would be no. But I think in the future, as we get a bigger field testing footprint uh, and more technologies to test our products, and we start incorporating technologies like climate and, and field view into our testing program, we will understand which microbes work best in which geographies under which conditions. Right now, it, it is more of a blanket approach. It's, you know, put it out there in a wide geography and, and look at overall responses. But we're also moving away from just yield benefits, right? We're moving into how do these technologies benefit you in other ways other than just yield? Is it lodging resistance? Is it earlier planting dates? Is it faster maturities, more even maturities? Is it something that it, it raises the oil content of your canola or helps you with straight cuts? So it's, I mean, it's very complex and, and we're, you know, we're only two years into this alliance and field testing, but that's where we're going definitely. Okay, great. Next question is, does quick roots work to suppress soil borne pathogens? Quick roots is sold right now as a biofertility product that helps to free up nutrients and feed the plant. And that's, those are the claims that we can make, and that's all I can say about that. All it's right. not the best okay. answer, but I'm, I'm, my hands are a bit tied on that one. Okay, now here's where I have to say hard stuff. Does the Bacillus amyloliquefaciens in quick roots produce also metabolites which have plant protection properties? Sort of the same question. That's, it's yeah, it's basically uh, a similar question. Um, I'm not going to wade too deep into that one. I'll just say that uh, both the Bacillus amyloliquefaciens and the the Trichoderma virans are found in biocontrol products that are registered in Canada. Okay. But we are our claims are our centered our our claims are centered around biofertility. Great. So, so one last I, I'll actually then. jump in a little okay. bit on that one. Okay. Um, so serenade is in a is very is in a similar family there, um, and it does have those sorts of um, metabolites and properties of soil disease depression when applied in the soil. Um, and there are actually some really interesting results we've gotten lately in some other countries with showing that certain plant diseases that are resident in the soil and then sporulate and the spores go infect the surface of the plant. If you have serenade in the soil, you see less of that sporulation. Um, but Serenade is, as I've said, registered as both a soil applied product as well as a foliar product, and therefore we are registered through that uh, pesticidal registration. For other products that are not registered as pesticides, as um, John has been talking about, um, they don't make those claims, and so generally um, for those sorts of products and as they're developed, you make sure you try not to ask those questions as well. Okay, so that kind of leads into the next one. It says, uh, you've spoken a lot about seed-applied biologicals. Is there much work being done on foliar-applied biologicals? So within the BioAg uh, Alliance, we're, we're, we're focused right now on seed and granular, but I think Adrian is, is poised to answer this question a little bit. Yeah, so, we, um, so currently Bayer has a product, Serenade, there's also another product, Sapata, both of which are foliar applied biologicals. Um, we're also in the process of developing other foliar applied biologicals, um, both in pest control as well as disease control. All righty. So that's the end of the questions that we had in the, in the box. Once again, I'd like to thank everybody for participating and hanging on. We went a little bit over time. And to our speakers, great presentations, very interesting. And again, I'd like to thank our sponsors, Bayer, Syngenta, CCAN, FP Genetics, and 2020 Seed Labs. So just to let you know that this webinar has been recorded, and it will be on the germination, germination.ca website. Usually we try within 48 hours, but certainly very quickly. There is one more strategy session left in this series of strategy sessions for, for Germination Magazine, and it's going to focus on what's changing around seed-applied insecticides, and uh, I hope you'll join us for that one. So once again, everyone, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you to our speakers and to our sponsors, and hopefully we'll talk to you again in a month or so. Mm -hmm.